Take, take the Lord with you everywhere you go. You've got to take, take the Lord with you everywhere you go. You've got to take, take the Lord with you everywhere you go. In the street, in the street, in the home. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, a people shall be for his throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. 
Welcome everybody to our service, whether you're here in person or those of you who are joining us online. We're really happy for everyone who's joining us. And um, I think Sam reminded us a few weeks ago, if you're online, to um, post a comment there so that we actually know that you're there and can, can greet you. Um, if you are visiting, there are some welcome cards out in the foyer on the table, so we'd encourage you to fill that out so we can stay in touch. There are also communion cups on the table, if you haven't grabbed that. We'll have communion together in just a couple of minutes. And also, um, you can leave your contribution in the foyer, or you can mail it into the church office. Just a couple of announcements. We have um, <clears throat> the women's retreat, which has been postponed. So if you had not been able to register already, you have a second chance. It's now going to be April 23rd and 24th. Um, at the Holiday Inn Express in St. Simons Island. There is a $30 deposit, and um, you can pay that now to reserve your spot. The rest, um, if your single occupancy is $150, and double, double occupancy is $80. So if you're interested in that, contact Janet. The heart group, women's heart group, is going to be kicking off again soon. You can sign up until next Sunday if you want to be a part of that. We'll have the banquet on the 27th. And you can sign up at the women's ministry table or call or email the church office. And the groups are going to be small, and they will be starting in March, so hope that you can participate in that. And other than that, we also have a zoo day for the children on March 6th, uh, Beach Devo and Bonfire for the student ministry at Atlantic Beach on February 14th. If you're going to go to that, you can meet at the building at 4.30 to carpool together. And um, the student ministry will also have a game and movie night on March, 6th, on March 6th and a camp out at the Gardeners on March 19th. So hope everyone enjoys the service and it's good to see everyone here together today. Just wanted to say sorry about that, everybody. Mm -hmm. This is season for a new anointing. This is season for a fresh outpouring. That sun's and hearts of the King of Lord our eyes and shine. That sun's and hearts of the King of Lord may rise and shine as we declare. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day. Let your glory 
We have come to a part of our service to me that is always a highlight. Uh, being able to be with fellow Christians, being able to fellowship, and be encouraged by seeing your face is uh, wonderful, especially during our time that we're living. But most of all, we have an opportunity to participate in a feast that to me is the highlight of the day, especially to being able to do it with fellow Christians. So as we prepare our minds for communion today, I'd like to share a story with you. It's uh, in some ways religious, in other ways it's not, but I uh, hope you will enjoy, uh, grasp the meaning of the story, especially at the end. This is a story about World War II and some fellows who had lost one of their closest friends in a, in a battle. And it was toward the end of the day. They were gathering together and they said, you know, we can't leave him here. The idea of never leave a comrade behind was very prevalent in their mind. So they picked him up and carried him uh, over a hill, and they looked where they, they were thinking about burying him there, but they saw some lights from the city. So they said, well, there's, maybe there's a cemetery there that we can use. So they carried their friend to the cemetery gate, and there was a person, a caretaker, standing outside the gate. And so they said, sir, uh, we have a comrade of ours that we would like to give a decent burial to. He died in uh, the war, and uh, we would like to bury him before we move on. And this was a 
priest, because this was a Catholic cemetery. And the priest said, uh, okay, said, was he Catholic? And they looked at each other and said, I don't know. I never asked him, so I don't know. So they said, well, look at the dog tag. So I looked at the dog tag and it had a P on it for Protestant. The priest looked at them and said, uh, guys, I, I just I can't do it. He said, this is a Catholic cemetery and only Catholics are buried here. So they looked at each other, very distraught, and said, okay. So they walked away carrying their friend. But as they went out by the fence of the cemetery, they said, let's bury him here. So along the edge of the fence, they buried their comrade. And they went on because the platoon was camped on a hill fairly close, and they went on to the camp for the night. The next day, they said, let's pay our last respects before we move on. So they moved over close to the cemetery, walking over, and they started looking around, and they couldn't find the grave. They looked, and they looked, and they looked, and said, we buried him right over here. Where, where is he? And about that time, they said, well, let's go ask the priest. There he is. So they went over and looked at the priest, and he was sort of disheveled. His hair was messed up, and his clothes were just wrinkled. And said, sir, we were here yesterday, and we asked you about burying our comrade. And so we buried him on the outside of the fence here, but we can't find the grave. And the priest looked, and he looked down. He said, well, after you guys left, said I was very disturbed. I didn't sleep last night. Said I spent the first night, part of the night, just tossing and turning. And the second part of the night, I spent moving the fence. So he had gotten remorse to the point of deciding to move the fence to include this person. And one Friday, long time ago, probably around three o'clock, Jesus uttered these words, it is finished, and he moved the fence. Because he included you and me as Gentiles in his kingdom was allowing mankind to become a part of the kingdom. Jesus moved the fence. Thank God he moved the fence because you and I would have not been included in that group if he hadn't. So as we remember Jesus on that cross and the suffering that he experienced. Let's position ourselves with thanksgiving and appreciation for that sacrifice. Would you bow with me? Father, I can never understand why you would love me so much or give your son for my forgiveness, but you did. Your love is unsearchable, and your grace is amazing. Thank you for making you, me my, your child. Thank you for that sacrifice, for that blood that continues to cleanse and make me whole. As we partake of these emblems, may they have a special meaning of your son's body and blood that was given for all of mankind. Pray these thoughts in Jesus' name. Amen.
Children, you know who you are. You can be dismissed at this time for kids' worship. Grades K through 3. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But... The king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. Blessed be your name, a land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name.
this next song is actually one of my favorites, so if I can have everybody stand for this one. <laughs> These are the days of the Lord. to come up here and preach. <laughs> but today is a good morning. I'm going to start off this week just like I did last week in that phrase. Good morning. Today is good. Today's a good day. Okay. There could be a lot of bad things that are happening. There could be a lot of things that are on your mind that are heavy on your heart. But I assure you that today is good because there's life in our bodies. There's life in our lungs. There's breath in our lungs. God has given us this day. So the best way, the best way to come in today is to walk in today in gratitude, to be grateful for this day, for what we have. What, the fact that we're walking in today or crawling in today or rolling or lying in bed today, today God has given us this day. And so today is a good day. And I hope you feel it. I hope you know that. It was told to me this morning um, and like I mentioned last week, that the sun is out. Well, the sun is out in some respects. It's somewhat gloomy, but the sun came out again today. What do you know? The, the sun is out again today because our God not only created this world, but he continues to create. We need to understand that because today is the day, today is the day that the Lord has made. So he is making this day. He's not absent from his creation. No, he is sustaining life. He gives life. And so we have that today. And so I'm grateful for that. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Last week, I know that some of you missed out and it was requested. You didn't get to see our Alaska wood frog. So here he is. Okay. So here he is just perched up on this limb or this branch or whatever, completely frozen for seven months. Can you even imagine? being frozen for seven months. So there he is. I'll also share with you today, this is in Australia, you can find the pygmy possum. 
Look at this little tiny possum. He's in a family of possum. This is like the, the, the smallest one, okay? How many of you have seen before the pygmy possum? Show of hands. Okay, I'll let you know. For you guys listening, maybe some of you have, but there's zero hands. So none of us came in today understanding that there was this creature in the world. Well, let me tell you, this creature is the smallest of the small. He's only six centimeters long, weighs only seven grams. Would you like to know what this little guy eats? This little guy, he eats some nectar, but he preys mainly on insects and some small lizards. But yeah, I never knew anything about the pygmy possum. But here's the thing, God's creation is so amazing that you could have a new discovery every single day. Every single day, if you look and you see what God has made on this earth, it truly is mind-boggling. So anyways, we come here together in gratitude for the day that God has given us. We recognize how amazing our God truly is this morning. And before we kind of move on any longer, I also need to let you know that apparently I am a great imposter. <laughs> the truth. I cannot play the ram horn. <laughs> now, I think that many of you may be sad right now. But as the hat says on the screen, if you can't see it, what had happened was that in my preparation, I can't play the ram horn. I, now, I tried, I looked into it, I tried to practice it, I can't do it. But in that process, I had a co-conspirator back here, Craig in the AV booth, had an audio clip of a, a ram horn being played. And he played it and I pretended to play the ram horn. Now, in my mind, in my mind, I just assumed that everyone would understand what was going on, but at the end of the service, I'm getting all these compliments on my skill <laughs> of being able to play a ram horn, and I wish I could. It's on my bucket list, I promise, but I cannot play the ram horn, and I felt like if I didn't clear that up, it would just haunt me for some of you thinking I'm this great ram horn player. So there's that. But we are in a series called Courage in New Land. Here we are at the beginning of a year. We're looking into new, new possibilities, new land, new opportunity. Where are you leading, God? We don't know. <laughs> we don't know what the, the, the state of this country is, where we're going. There's all these uncertainties we don't know. But, God, where is it? And we've determined from the very beginning that courage will be required no matter where God is leading, no, where, no matter what the fate is of this church, of your family, of this country, of this world, no matter what it is, we need courage to walk into wherever God is leading. So we need courage in new land. And so we've learned from the book of Joshua, we've been studying the book of Joshua, and we've been learning from the story of Joshua and also pulling out the theme of courage that follows the book of Joshua. So from the beginning, we've seen the calling of Joshua and the preparation of Joshua. Because God prepared Joshua, born into slavery, lived a life in the wilderness, was one of the 12 spies who originally said, God can provide for us to take this inherited land. And so God prepared Joshua, and he called Joshua, and he said to Joshua, anywhere that you're, the sole of your foot touches is land that I'm giving to you. In all the days of your life, no one will be able to stand up against you. And so we saw from the very beginning, God calling Joshua, and he says, be strong and courageous. Only be strong and courageous and it is so important that we understand that the connection, why we have this courage, is not in who we are. It was not in who Joshua is. It doesn't have anything to do with your skill, your ability of who you are. It has only to do with this, that you are connected. You have close proximity with the Creator God. And that's why from the very first page of Joshua, the instruction to Joshua is to meditate on the word of God day and night. Don't ever let the words of God leave your mouth. Be connected with your creator. Be strong and courageous. So we saw God calling Joshua, and then we saw this all-in surrender of Rahab, who became a traitor of Jericho, who harbored spies and lied to the king because she knew who the true God was. We saw this all-in surrender of the spies who came back with a report that said, yes, 
We can take the land. A message that Joshua wanted to hear so bad. He was one of the original good spies who had that good report. And now so many years later, he's waiting to hear from them. And they say, yes, they're all in. We saw the all in surrender of the people of God when they set out from their tents to cross the Jordan. Because when they crossed the Jordan, they were going to war. And in our lives, we have to be all in no matter what it is. I could die tomorrow, Lord. I'm all in for you. Then we saw the stones as they went through the Jordan, as they passed through the Jordan on dry ground. Similarly to a generation before them and their parents, their moms and their dads and their grandfathers and their aunts and their uncles, they passed through the Red Sea that Moses parted. And they passed on dry ground. This time, they go in a little bit different way. And the water piles up in one great heap and they pass over on dry ground. And they pick up these stones. They pick up these stones from the riverbed. And they make this monument to remember that these stones will serve you. They'll serve your memory. To remember God's power. To remember God's faithfulness. Because if we're going to have courage, not in us, but in, our, in God's ability and if we're going to be all in for you, God, no matter what it is, we need to remember his power and his faithfulness. And so the people of God make this physical reminder to remember that. And then we saw last week this continuation of this advice, this only advice, only be strong and courageous. Like there's nothing really else that you got to do, only this. And then we saw the same kind of line of advice, only just, on, just march. Here's the battle plan for Jericho. I just need you to march, march around the city. That's it. And I need you to be silent sometime, and I need you to shout sometime, and I need you to play an, a musical instrument. So only follow the ark, only be silent, only shout. Joshua, you're this great leader, but you're going to Jericho. What do I got to do when he meets the commander of the army? What do I got to do? What does the Lord say for me? You remember what he said? He said, take off your shoes. What? <laughs> take off your shoes because the ground that you're standing on is holy. And I want you to feel the ground, the earth that God made with the feet that God made. I want you to be close. It's a proximity issue with our creator, God, that makes us battle ready. And so we left last week with this question on our heart, are you battle ready? Are you battle ready? Because there is a battle that is happening, that's been happening. From the creation of this world, there's a battle of good and evil. And how is evil trying to attack you personally, your family, this church, this country, this world? Are you battle ready? You don't have to have this elaborate scheme, a battle plan to fight evil, but what you have to do is be battle ready only. Only be close to your creator. That's how you are battle ready. So we left off last week. Jericho is burning. They've taken, they've taken the city of Jericho. It's literally burning. Joshua has done a great job leading the people and an important thing that we need to know and understand as we continue in the book of Joshua is that the book of Joshua contains the battle conquest of the people of God. They take many nations, many people, and there's complete destruction. There's complete destruction. And for so many people, this is an issue that hinders their faith because they see and they question, how in the world could a loving God take out complete nations? How could God do that? And so that's a barrier for a lot of people. And so I want to address that just a little bit for some of the harsh things that we see in the book of Joshua. And so I'm going to give us a little bit of a context to understand what God is doing in this taking out of nations. And so we're going to go back to Genesis 15 for a moment. And this is the covenant promise with Abraham. So all the way from the beginning, when God promises to Abraham, listen to this. In chapter 15, verses, starting in verse 12, as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offering will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. God is telling what is going to take place. 
but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. And afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back in here on the fourth generation. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Now, I've highlighted and bolded that statement. I don't want us to dig into that a little bit. So God is telling Abram, there's more for you. I have a promise for you and your descendants. There's land that I want to give to you, land that is currently not yours, that is possessed by others. But there's a connection with you taking ownership of this land and the iniquity of the people in the land. So let's read about that. We learn in Deuteronomy 12, 29 through 31. It says, when the Lord your God cuts off before you the nations whom you go in to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land, take care that you be not ensnared to follow them after they have been destroyed before you, and that you do not inquire about their gods, saying, how did these nations serve their gods that I also may do the same? You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abominable thing that the Lord hates, they have done for their gods, for they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. So we're reading about the iniquity of the Amorites, the people who, whose land that God's people would dispossess. And we're learning about the things, the abominations that they were involved in, including child sacrifice to gods. No small thing. So we move on to read a warning against God's people about this even further. In Leviticus 18, 21 through 30, it says, you shall not give any of your children to offer them to Moloch. And so we have identified the God that they are offering child sacrifices to. And so profane the name of God, I am the Lord. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. And you shall not lie with any animal and so make it yourself unclean with it. Neither shall any woman give herself to an animal to lie with it in perversion. Do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things, for by all these the nations I am driving out before you have become unclean, and the land became unclean, so that I punished its iniquity, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you shall keep my statutes and my rules, and none of these abominations, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you, for the people of the land who are before you did all of these abominations so that the land became unclean, lest the land vomit you out when you make it unclean, as it vomited out the nation that was before you. For everyone who does any of these abominations, the person who, who, do, who do them shall be cut off from among their people. So keep my charge, never practice any of these abominable customs that they practice before you, and never to make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. So the land has becoming defiled by the abominations and God is putting an end to it. And so what the conquest is in, in these lands, dispossessing the nations in these lands is an act of God. It's an act of God similar to that that we see in the flood on a grand scale. Here God is isolating nations. It's an act of God. And the path away from God leads to selfishness and leads ultimately to depravity and ultimately to death because life is always, always in the hand of the creator. So I say all of that to give you a little bit of understanding, a little bit of context to understand the conquest that we read about. But you can, you have the free will at this point in time to bring judgment upon the life giver. You can, as a created one, bring judgment to the God who not only gives life but also takes it away. You can do that. You can do that being removed from the situation thousands of years with minimal detail. You can bring judgment on the life giver who also takes life. But in that assessment, when you bring judgment to the creator God who takes life, don't forget the fact that he died for you. And so I know that's some kind of heavy stuff, but I didn't want to not address that because I know that is for a lot of people an issue that they deal with in understanding and getting their head around how could God do something like this? 
So hopefully that's helpful to you if that is you this morning. So this morning, we pick back up in the story in chapter 7. Again, the smoke is still rising from Jericho. God has given them victory in Jericho. And so in chapter 7, starting in verse 1, we'll read the first nine verses together. It says, but the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. The devoted things were the thing, all the things that they were to destroy. They were not to take anything for themselves. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. And the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Aven, east of Bethel, and said to them, go up and spy out the land. And the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, do not have all the people go up, but let about two or 3,000 men go up and attack Ai. Do not make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. So about 3,000 men went up from the people, and they, fled bef- and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gates as far as uh, Shebarim and struck them at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought this people? Why? Why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all? To give us into the hands of the Amorites? To destroy us? Would that we have been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. Oh Lord, what can I say when Israel has turned their backs before their enemies for the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us and cut off your name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? So wow, there's a lot there that we've got to unpack. But we begin the chapter with understanding that in the smoke that's rising from Jericho, Achan, has stolen some of the devoted things to God. God gave them the specific warning before they went into battle not to do this. And if they did this, he told them what the consequences would be. But Achan does this. And so here is the first attempt now to conquer another land. We're moving past Jericho now to the next one, which is Ai. And just like before, Joshua sends out spies. He sends out two spies to Ai, and when they go and they look, they come back and they say, listen, this is easy. This is nothing. You don't have to bring everybody. Just bring two to 3,000 and we'll be fine. And so they do that, and they bring, bring 3,000 men, and they, they have to flee in defeat. And 30, 36 men die in the process. And so they're devastated by this. They're devastated by this. It says Joshua falls to the earth, his face on the earth near the ark, him and his elders, and they put dust on their head, and they're saying, why? And it sounds very much like when they crossed the Red Sea, like, why did we even come here, Lord? Maybe we should have just stayed on the other side of the Jordan until God reveals to him what is taking place. Because their fear was now that the the enemy nations around them would not fear them any longer. And so then God comes into the scene. In verse 10, it says, the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant and command, that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put among their belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted. They, the people of God, have become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Get up. Consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourself for tomorrow. Consecrate yourself for tomorrow. For thus says the Lord, God of Israel, there are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. So we move past verse 13. God reveals to Joshua why they lost the battle at Ai. 
They lost the battle of Ai because sin is now in the camp. They did exactly what God told them not to do. It didn't take long for that rebel rebellion to take place. And so we read, I'll summarize for you, verses 14 through 18. Basically, he, he, he wakes up in the, in the morning. I meant to, to bring this as a visual aid to you today, but they cast lots, okay? You've done this before. You get a few sticks or straws or something, and one of them is shorter than the others, but you can't see, and you're all holding them in your hand, and, and everyone draws a stick or a straw, and whoever has the short one, they've been selected, Okay, this is what they're doing in this process when they're casting lots. And so what they do is they need to identify who it is that has stolen these devoted things. And they do it by casting lot with God's blessing to do this. But imagine the scene. First, they take all the tribes that cast lot. Which tribe is it? Aha, you're the tribe. Then they take that tribe and they go clan by clan. They cast lots. Which clan is it? Aha, it's this one. They go tribe by tribe, clan by clan, then family by family, all the way to an individual level, which guess what? The short lot fell upon Achan, the very same person who stole the devoted things. He had stolen devoted things and he had buried them in his tent. And he confesses this. He confesses what he did. The treasure is buried in his, in his tent. And what he stole was a beautiful cloak. He took some gold and he took some silver and he buried it. And the rest of chapter 7 unfolds the fate of Achan. And if you're not familiar with the story of Achan, again, this is some of the harshness that we may throw judgment against the life giver. But Achan, the fate of Achan was that he, his family, his possessions, his stolen devoted things, they were all taken to the valley of Achor and they were stoned and burned. It says they raised a great heap of stones over him. And I could not help but think of the, in this moment of the heap of stones that we've been reading about. We've read about this heap of stones that they formed to remember what God and his power did. And now here they have this heap of stones over the burial site of Achan, who chose to go against the command of God. Now before we move into chapter 8, because chapter 8 is the second attempt to take Ai, I want to just take a moment and consider Achan with you this morning a little bit. Think about this. In the celebration of Jericho, in the celebration of Jericho, disobedience took no time at all for God's people to fail. Why? Why, Achan? Didn't Achan pass on dry ground across the Jordan? Wasn't he explicitly told not to do exactly what he did? Why, Achan? Don't you remember passing by the ark and seeing this great heap of water that God had stopped to prepare you, to lead you? Why would you do this? He saw treasure. And he wanted it. And he took it. He thought he couldn't pass the opportunity up. Now, if we dig a little bit into that reason, the deeper meaning behind that that's not stated is this, is that he thought that he knew what was best for him. This belief is also found in us. That's evidenced not only by Aiken's actions, but our actions as well. And this belief is this. I believe I understand how to be fulfilled better than God. You or I may never say this, but it will be evidence in our life by our actions. It was evidence in the life of Achan with his buried treasures in his tent that I believe that I can be, I believe I understand how to be fulfilled better than God. Even though God said, don't take any of the devoted things, I saw that treasure and I knew, well, I, I need that. No one's going to know. It's ultimately better for me and I'll be fulfilled in that. Now, that may sound outrageous to you, but I want you to understand that it makes sense. It makes sense, that type of mentality, from a physical, earthly perspective. 
what I desire and what I oppose, how could that be anybody other than myself? Right? The things that I want, the things that I desire, the things that I hate, the things that I oppose, how could it be anybody other than me? And we get these cultural confirmations of this type of thinking as well, right? If it feels good, do it. If it feels right, follow your heart. Follow your own path. My truth, right? My truth really means my perception. Because it may not be truth, but it might be your truth. It's, it's your perception. And then we hear that phrase, well, perception is reality. Well, there's a missing word in that because it, what it really means is perception is your reality, And so we have these confirmations in culture about this idea that I myself can determine what's best for me. I myself can understand what will fulfill me the most. And so follow, you do you, right? Again, this makes sense in a natural experience based solely on our perception, okay? It makes sense. I mean, after all, this is my mind, it's my thoughts, it's my tastes, my fears, it's my desires, right? I should know what best fulfills me. But I want to remind you this morning that this is not my home. This, my skin, this body, it's temporary. We need to know this. We need to understand this. This home, this where I live is not my true home. We need to understand that. It goes beyond just our perception of the here and now. The reality is, is that we live a spiritual experience based also, not just on our perception, but based also on our faith in the Creator God. And when we have faith in the Creator God, when we have faith in Him, what happens in that process is that we begin to die to ourself and to our will and what we would think what would be best for us. Our living faith is not simply accepting the fact of Christ, but our living faith is dying to our will. Think of Jesus in the garden. When he is facing the cross, he says, Lord, please let this cup pass, but not my will. Not my will, but yours be done. We need to, like Mary, may it be unto me as according to your word. We read in Matthew 20, 28, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so what's best for me is not just what I perceive to be what's best for me. How I need to be fulfilled is also, there's a huge faith component where I die to myself and it's more about the will of God and not about my will. And I may see those treasures, and I may say, I want them, and I know better than what God says for me. And so I'm going to take those treasures, I'm going to bury them in my tent. Or we can have the faith to do as God said, and to die to our will, to die to our perception of what we think may be best for us, and to say, God, lead me, I'm yours. Lead me, I am yours. You know, I've been experiencing this in prayer discovering this, and I wanted to tell you this just from a personal experience and testimony from this stage this morning, I want you to know how empowering, how liberating this is if you adopt this in your prayer life. And it's not one specific thing, it's not a certain prayer that you pray, but it's more of an idea and a concept of how we approach God and is this, it is less what I want and more asking for his will to be done. And that I can trust the plan. It's easy to go to God with all the the wants and the things that you desire and the things that you want to be different. The things that you want for your life and you want for the people that you love and say, God, change this. Heal them. Do this. Give me this job. Lead me here. Give me this answer. It's easy because that's all based on our perception and what we think is best for ourselves. But what might be a little bit harder is to go to God and not ask for the things that we desire, but ask God, Lord, I just want your will to be done no matter what that is. 
Because ultimately, who knows what's best for you? You or your creator? Who do you think you are to think that you would have a better idea of what's good for you more so than your creator God? So we can experience this in prayer and understand what the implications of this mean. Less about what I want and more about bring your will no matter what that means because what that means is you may want to get healthy tomorrow but God may want to end your life. Lord, in my life right this moment it is for your glory and according to your plan. Can you say that? Can you be okay with the will of God that will play out in your life in any and every way? Do you trust him that much? Do you trust him to allow your will to be secondary to what his will is? Not my will, but your will be done, Lord. But Achan sees this treasure and he thinks he knows what's best for him. God knows what's best for us, right? I mean, he's the creator God. He's the creator God. He made you. Remind you of a few things. He knit you together in your mother's womb. You realize that you're not just an accident. You're just not just a random mashup of, 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 of chance. But God himself, the creator God, knit you together. I don't know of how many of you knit. But God knit you together. He made you. He created you. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows the amount of hair on your head. I get it. It's zero. I get it. Okay? But he knows the hairs on your head. He knows everything about you. He knows the words that you say before you say them. And he loves you and he died for you. Who do you think knows what's best for you? You? Or the creator God? Man, this is a liberating thing when we can experience in this in our life that we don't even have to know the battle plan. Yeah, ram's horn, take off your shoes, just march around. We don't even need to know because it's who we are with, the creator God. We can have courage in that. That can liberate the things that we have to, to, to stress over and pray over. Lord, let your will be done. So let's not forget this and have the courage to go wherever and be used in whatever way that he desires for us. So we'll continue back to I in chapter 8, verse 1. It says, And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear and do not be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you and arise. Go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hands the king of Ai. And his people, his city, his land. And you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoil and its livestock you shall take as plunder for yourselves. Lay an ambush against the city behind it. And so then we move from chapter, or from uh, verse 2, uh, verses 3 through 9. I'll summarize for you. Basically, it is the battle plan that God tells to Joshua. So just like God had foretold what was going to happen when they crossed the Jordan, just like God foretold what was going to happen, how they were going to take Jericho, God also does the same thing with Ai. And he tells them what the battle plan is and what it will happen. And the battle plan is this. Take 30,000 men. Not the 3,000 that you originally went, but I want you to take 30,000 men. And when you go up to this place, you're going to split them up. You're going to have one group that's going to go behind the city, one group that's going to be in front of the city. And the group that's in front of the city is going to draw them out. And they're going to pretend like they're in defeat and flee. And as they flee, they're going to pursue them. The people of Ai are going to pursue them. As, as they pursue them, the people that are in the back are now going to ambush Ai. They're going to take the city and they're going to burn the city at Joshua's signal. And, they, and when the other group saw smoke rising from Ai, they would then join them. And it's this amazing, elaborate, really great battle plan. And guess what? Guess what happens? Anybody? <laughs> it happens exactly how God said it would. 
Time and time again, we see this. It happened exactly how God said it was, just as before. And so verses 10 through 30 detail this battle plan. God already told everything that was happening, so you can read it for yourself, but it happens exactly like God said it would. And then we're going to end our time this morning at the very last section of chapter 8. At that time, this is in verse 30, at that time Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, on Mount Ebal, just as Moses... This is going to come into play just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the people of Israel. As it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones upon which no man has wielded an iron tool, and they offered it on it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And there, in the presence of the people of Israel, he wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written. And all Israel, sojourner as well as native-born, with their elders and officers and their judges, stood on opposite sides of the ark before the Levitical priest who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord, half of them in front of Mount Gerizim, Gerizim, and half of them in front of Mount Ebal. Just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded at the first to bless the people of Israel. And afterward, he read all of the words of the law, the blessing and the curse, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses commanded that Joshua did not read before the assembly of Israel and the women and the little ones and the sojourners who lived among you. So here we have at the end of chapter 8, we've got this scene. But what's important to understand that we can read, if you want to go for yourself, Deuteronomy chapter 27, we can see where God tells Moses, this is exactly what's going to take place when you cross over the Jordan into my land. These tribes will be in front of Mount Ebal. These tribes will be in front of Mount Gerizim. And everything that God foretold takes place here in this chapter 8. And so I want us to picture this for a moment. Picture this scene. You've got God's people in front of two mountains. You've got half of them on one side, half of them on the other, and you've got the Ark of the Covenant that's in the middle between them. And here they are, in front, in the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God is right in the middle, and they're hearing the blessings of being in covenant with the Creator. And they're also hearing the curses of following your own desires and following the ways of the people of the land that they dispossessed. Listen, they've been through so much. Think of the past weeks, that what they've experienced. They've, They've had this miraculous crossing of the Jordan, of God's leading them. They've had to circumcise a nation. They had the victory at Jericho, and then they had the defeat of Ai, the tragedy of Achan, and now they have this victory at Ai on the second attempt. What would be going through your mind and the lessons that you've learned through this? What would you be thinking? Well, I know one thing I would be thinking, and that is this. I do not want to go into battle without the Lord. I think that's been made evidently clear that I don't want to go into battle without the Lord. And here they are, they've got a pile of stones reminding them of God's power, His ability to lead them, to provide for them, to be the strength, to be the power. It doesn't have anything to do with your capability. It doesn't have anything to do with your strength. It doesn't have anything to do with your gifting. But it has everything to do with your proximity Independence upon the Creator God. And so here we have this pile of stones reminding them of God's power and faithfulness. And we've got another stone pile, a great heap of pile over Achan, reminding them of abandoning God and assuming that we have the ability to to understand what would fulfill us better than our Creator God. So, do we have the courage to surrender our will? Do we have the courage to do that? If we are here this morning and you're assuming that you have the ability to decipher your best interest above God's and I don't know what I can do for you. 
Because what we need to do, we need to learn from what we've read in the text. We need to understand this applies to us as well, that we've got to be able to surrender our will, to understand that we cannot decipher what's best for us ultimately. We have to die to that will. We have to be willing to die to that will and say, it's not about what I want, it's about what you want. No matter what that means, even if I follow in the example of Jesus Christ in the garden who wants desperately for this cup to pass but says, not my will, but yours be done. When it doesn't make sense. When you know that nails and a cross are the next thing for you. Is what the will of God is for you. Would you give me the courage, Lord, to want your will more than I want mine? Do you have the courage this morning to desire that, to want that, to want to surrender your will above all for him and for what he desires? Man, I say this all the time. I've had a lot of conversations with many of you, but it's the truth. And that is this, when it comes about our will, and it comes about our desire, when we're able to die to selfishness, when we can die to selfishness, we discover what selfishness promised. <laughs> we get fulfilled with what we thought our selfishness would give us because God knows what's best for you. God knows what you need. And so I want to encourage us this morning to have the courage to put the will of God above our own personal will, what we would determine that would be best for us and fulfill us. Lord, it's about you and it's about your will. Bring your will. Use us in whatever way you desire. With that, let's go to God in prayer this morning. Lord, we just thank you for this day and I pray that you give us the courage to put your will above our will. We thank you, Lord, that we can be connected to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray this morning. Amen. If you want to respond to the word, we want to give you an opportunity. You can come forward as we sing. You can do this with someone after the service. But if you need to respond to the word of God, then there's an opportunity for you today. So if you have that need, then please come forward as we stand and as we sing. Break my heart, dear Lord, tear the barriers down, show me with conflicting tears, the Thank you all for coming to service, and thank you, Brad, for the confession. I was definitely pondering why you uh, were able to play the Rams horn that long. <laughs> all right, and 
I just want to let you all know that after this next song, it'll be closing and we'll be having class, so please do stay for that. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. I have a living hope. I have a future. God. Joshua is this fast-paced, exciting adventure of God's people who are claiming their inheritance. And we learn continually through this story that it is God who fights our battles. We just need to be courageous in where God leads us. From the very first page of Joshua, Joshua is encouraged to be strong and courageous. And Joshua lived his life continually choosing courage in opportunities of fear. Why? The same reason that you and I do not need to fear. Because when we are with the Lord, when we are walking with the Lord, we do not need to fear anything. In fact, I do not fear death itself. Death has been conquered. And so I can live my life courageously wherever it is that God may be leading me. And I pray that you are at peace with the Creator in your life, that you have the courage to walk through any trial, anything that might be in your path at this point in life. I'm praying for you. I want you to know, thank, I'm so grateful that you joined us today. And I'm also hoping that there may be some of you that want to partner with us in ministry. If you are a local, please come and join us. I'd love to be able to meet you and invite you into the blessing of family. And to anyone, if you are willing, I hope that you would consider supporting the work here financially. You can send in your checks to us directly or you can give online. Remember to love people, follow Jesus, serve the community, and praise God. I'll see you next time.